Let's continue uh, to uh, discuss uh, influence diffraction, and uh, um, there's uh, several different way of characterizing X-ray diffraction. But I still want to continue uh, some full circle X-ray diffractometers. Um, I know that the, you do not have particular type of full circle machine, uh, but I think it's uh, very important to know how to characterize uh, influence structures. So the, this is actually a diffractometer commonly used for thin film diffraction. And then um, this circle here is that you have the two circles attached to this we call goniometer. Okay, goniometer is a, uh, normally your powder diffractometer in your labs here. And then you have only these two. Okay, there's two components here. And one is attached to uh, this is a detector, uh, this is a tube, it's actually X-ray tube, and this is a detector. And detector itself is moves this angle, this is a two theta, and then attached to the, this one, this sample is attached, this is a theta, so you have only two angle motion. But you have a detector and the sample stage, and then this is an X-ray source, so actually you have diffraction is happens on the surface you mount your sample and the two set of motion is is actually detector motion detector moves and the theta is sample stage moves but the normally powder diffractometer you mount the sample on the surface here and the x-ray source not this way x-ray source is coming this way okay so this uh, is a set of two set of like a detector coming from here and the source coming from here it did go that way. But in order to really do scan, you need the four different circles and motion of chi angle and motion of phi angle. You need all four different angles. And then the reason is your synfluent samples is diffraction condition is, is only one diffraction condition because you have only alignment of the, all the crystalline, crystalline planes and you satisfied only one very condition. But as I yesterday, I draw the Ewer sphere construction. So I just did the animation here. When you do this theta two theta motion, and then you can see how this. Okay, what is that? So here motion you can see the detector and then this uh, theta motion. You can go independently. Okay, this is theta or two theta motion independent, then you theta motion later, the theta motion like this. Okay, you have a, can you see those two? Okay, theta and two theta move independently. Most of powder diffractometer all you use is not really use independent motion, is is continuous motion, a coupled motion. We call the coupled scan, which means always theta is half of the two theta value. So that means both starting from zero, and then theta moves this much, and the two theta move twice as faster. That is the break condition, always we call bisecting condition. Bisecting means a divide by half, and then that's bisecting condition. In, in this geometry, if a theta and two theta move independently, that's why you can do the rocking curve. Okay, rocking curve, you don't measure it, you have set the position here Grad condition of two theta, and move this uh, theta motion is going back and forth, like a scan those things, and there's a rocking curve scan. So we can see in here it's not coupled scan. This is the actually independent scan of those two. I just simulated it. It's, it's a, to see easily. It's a very fast motion. Okay, and then and this one is later. I move this one to theta motion. Okay, but Additional motion, you need phi rotation, and you have a chi rotation because this whole sample moves this way, and the whole sample moves this way. Okay. 
Okay, so that's a four different uh, motion. And then uh, when you look at this uh, rocking curve scan, without changing two theta, move ka, o, 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 omega angle, which is a <coughs> theta angle, or not the chi angle. This depends on the theta angle. So you basically move this position theta and the theta motion. And then here, you do not have those kind of movie, but you move only sample motion. That's a rocking curve. And then we also measure, it's not the rocking curve, it's a different rocking, but the phi angle, you chi angle move this way. Okay, so that's why remember that I, I talked about sample motion is setting here. It's a same setting here. It's, it, it, theta motion is this. Okay, so theta motion this, chi motion this, and phi motion that way. Okay, so that's a four different angle. And it is the actual four circle diffractometer is, is similar to like if you go to single crystal machine here. You know? So I went there, saw that, and single crystal motion has a very similar type of motors. And then they attach the CCD camera to capture all the all the rag peaks. And then but the distance is so close to each other and then it's not ideal for thin films. But thin film the single crystal is, is, is ideal for that one. And then the, the diffractometer you have a powder diffractometer is designed for complete random oriented powder, but if you amount your thin film sample, for example, your miscut angle, like a few degrees miscut angle, you won't be able to find the peak at all. Because it's not bisecting condition. If a surface plane is away from the actual crystal plane, so you just mount it and try to scan it whatever angle, two theta angle and theta angle, and you won't be able to see it. Because you have to bound to your sample, align your sample to find the bright condition, move this rocking, and move this, and find the position. So that's why the thin films, you need to actually do that. Either if you cannot do this way by automatic version, then you have to mount your sample, you call your centimic goniometer hat, which means you manually you just tweak a little bit, a little bit manually and find the position of the rocking. Which means your bright condition is, is always this half, this one follows the half of this two theta. And once you find the bright condition, then you have to move your sample and then move a little bit, little bit, little bit and find the position. So that is you can manually, you can build a goniometer hat or you can buy your eccentric goniometer hat to mount it and you can tweak it. But that is another trick you can do manually. But it's very time consuming. But you can do that. And then uh, the problem of the most of thin films is it looks like this. Is you grow your thin films, not perfect single crystal. It's textured thin film. Looks like either, remember that the like brick word? And then these are from the top view. And the top view, you have a lot of different. And this one is more like oriented, it's like a square oriented, but you see a lot of those things like a 45 degree, 30 degree orientation. So you have to determine whether your film is this or your film that way, or your perfect single crystal, and or complete random, and depending on your degree of the crystalline quality, and then you're, you're measuring your films, your materials, and then it's different. So first you have to really know what you're measuring. So your mosaic spread is out of plane mosaic spread and the in plane mosaic spread. This is from the top view, okay? from the top view like this, like, like this top view. But the side view, you see this kind of mosaic spread. This kind of mosaic spread and this kind of mosaic spread, you have to measure those. So measuring this kind of mosaic spread is using rocking curve. And then this kind of mosaic spread, you have to do phi scan. Okay? So phi scan is the way I mentioned this. So out of plane mosaic spread, you have this kind of mosaic spread on perfect single crystal substrate, and then those two all different bright conditions. So for example, you have these kind of three different grains, and then this grain and that grain, that grain, and then maybe first one bright condition meet for this one, okay? So this one, this one bright condition. For well, theta and theta is the same angle, and then bright condition is is that meet. So these two are out of the bright condition. So in order to meet this one different bright condition, 
and then you have to move this one is no diffraction and no diffraction from this but you know the, to move this you move that way rock this way then you have this one break condition and other two doesn't have break condition so you, this one actually meet the break condition and then you lock this one more then you, this one have break condition and other ones doesn't have break condition so that means you know, each region of sample contribute to break condition and when you do that this kind of perfect single crystal without mosaic spread you get very sharp scan rocking curve scan is very sharp but when you have this kind of multiple domains and you have basically broad peaks okay so this is the definition of like the crystal inquiry people use and use this as a degree of the crystal inquiry mosaic spread measure this measure that so you have maximum and that is the actual diffraction and crystal quantity. But it's a rocking curve, it's a lot of things you can actually measure. It's focus space rocking curve, and that's very sharp one. But when you do this, you have a broader and then scan of the rocking curve. That's what is focus space. But you also have inflame mosaic spread. In inflame mosaic spread, you have perfect like this, and then you have this kind of mosaic spread. And this kind of mosaic spread cannot be detected by rocking curve. So in order to detect this one, you have to go to like a phi scan, off x scan. And then simply, I can show you this so geometry of this is looking at the, uh, going back to some simple way of describing uh, like a symmetry of this. Let me just explain that. And then, uh, Usually what you do is use a, this kind of stereo projection tell us what the symmetry of the older reflections. It's not this focus space lattice point, but you sort of pores, different pores of those things, projection of it. So for example, this is a very similar to what I use, is, is like a map, drawing map of the earth map. Okay, you got earth, the earth is all the location of the, the uh, location, India, Delhi, and then uh, the, um, the uh, Wisconsin or whatever location here and then on the surface of this but when you draw the map and then different types of map and when you maybe you remember you in your elementary school or middle school you learn the maps and then you have seen the different types of map and some maps like a shape like a broken map like you remember this kind of broken map and then this map is drawing three-dimensional like a surface sphere to on two-dimensional plane of the surface and then you have to do some different way of projection so one way to do is projection of of this when you just the whole surface of of the earth and cut the slices different slices and and then unfold it then you can have a map but that's a more realistic size realistic dimension of the realistic area and then on two dimensional, but it's, it's all disconnected. But the other way people use is a conventional map is just project it, it's expanded to two dimensional rectangular shape of paper, and that's why Russia looks big, India looks small. But India is not that small, India is huge, but the area, but it's a close to the equator, close to the uh, North Pole and South Pole, looks bigger. Okay, so that's the way you can draw the map. But another way you can draw the map is we call stereo projection. It's a projection of the <coughs> northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere on you know, the two-dimensional circle. You two-dimensional circle, you can draw all the location of the uh, the uh, map, and you can do that. This is very similar to stereo projection. All the different planes on the uh, crystals, and then those things creating all the pores on the surface of your sphere and those things can be projected on the two-dimensional plane of the circle and then that is the very similar to the north hemisphere map and southern hemisphere map on the circle so that what you do you have this kind of a circle the crystal olympic like a, uh, orientation and then you use this all the different types of plane okay plane pole means it's normal vector of the plane and that creating and this kind of pole, you see that 100 and 001 
this all the plane normal. The plane normal actually hit the surface of the sphere. And that's basically a certain valley or whatever location you can draw. And those things you can draw, those things at the 111 pole and 100 pole, you have a lot of poles. You can draw many, many planes. In, the, in this way, you can be, I mean, the infinite number of planes you can draw. And you do that, and then you have a lot of planes. Okay, like let's discuss Earth. And then when you do that, so you want to project all these things under this kind of gray circle in the middle, like equator circle. Okay, circle, the equator circle. And then you use this one projection of like when you use a laser pointer from here to hit here and putting like a semi-transparent paper in the circle and you point this region, you will see certain point, you can see laser point there. Okay, so that's a projection. The projection is like a vertical, not a vertical projection. It's a projection is coming from and this kind of projection. You draw the pointing laser pointer all the way here, exactly where it's penetrating. And that is the actual pole of this. Okay, so you can draw all these poles, and then these are poles here, and then different poles, and then these are 0, zero 1 poles, and those are 1, zero, zero, one, one, one poles. And then you draw this, and then you can make this one as a, this kind of projection. The nice thing about this projection, you will see all the planes, relationship of the angle and symmetry very easily. So what that means is, for example, I want to look at here, okay, 1, 1, 1, for example, 1, 1, 1 case, you have a 1, 1, 1 has 4, 4 symmetry. Angle from here to here, 54.7 degrees. So you change the chi angle, the chi angle from this, from initially this, 0, 0, 1 position, you want to find, this is 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0, so it is this one and that one, so mount it that way. You want to find this peak, you have to rotate 45 degrees first, and then you rock this one, 54.7 degrees. Okay, then if you go then, you can find this peak. Do you, do you understand this? Okay, so the, you know to find this peak, you have to go 90 degrees like this. Okay, you're 90 degrees, but you have this one, first you have to align your sample the way out of plane is this, and in plane is these two, one here, one there, so this is one zero, one zero zero and zero one zero. You can have those two, but this one is in the plane, and that's very hard to actually do X-ray except the grazing X-ray. X-ray. So offset scan to find this one, <coughs> you have to rock this, this, and go forty five degrees. Or forty five degrees first, or fifty four point seven degrees first. Okay, forty five first, phi angle, then fifty four point seven degrees. Okay, so then you find this peak. Okay, once you go. Okay, first once you go 45 degree, right? Then rock the 40 54.7 degree, then you have a rotational axis still here. Okay, rotational axis stay here. Then spin this, you spin that one, then spinning this one along this, uh, this circle. Spinning this one. You spinning this one, this circle, you will see one, two, three, four. You can see the peak. If you perfect single crystal, you will see this peak circling around, you see the peak every 90 degree. Okay? That is concept of phi scan. It's a phi scan may be hard to grasp phi scan, but that is basically, remember that I showed the movies? The movies? And movies is not this one. Movies is actually one-on-one -on -one reflection. It's, it's different one. And then one-on-one -on -one is... Uh, Okay, so maybe that's the, okay. So anyway, you actually circling around this and you can see the, all the peaks. So you, you have to pick, you have to pick one of this peak to find the symmetry. But for example, your single crystal is not aligned perfectly like this. So you have the domains, you have two different domains. One domain sitting like this, one domain sitting like a 45 degree. But this 45 degree domain, actually forming this all the circle rotate 45 degrees. 
So that means you all the peaks here, overlay two of them is 45 degree and 90 degree. Okay. So that means when you scan it, this peak is every 45 degree. So you see that additional peaks every 45 degree. So that actually tells the symmetry of and the mosaic spread or multi in-plane oriented domains, and which is very important to determine what kind of your crystalline quality is. And then, uh, so that is, is, is basically what you use the uh, X-ray diffraction. But here, we mentioned here, <coughs> so same thing here, you use the same kind of off axis peak, like a one, one, one. And then those things, like off, like misoriented this much, that gives a broadening of the peak. But you have to use off axis peak like 111 and 101 type of reflection. So, you know, the perfect one, you see the every 90 degree, but you have this kind of 45 degree one, it's a rotation of this 45 degree, you will see the another peak in the middle every 45, but this one tells your majority of the domain are 90 degree, then you have stronger peak, you have a small fraction of those, your smaller peak. So you have to actually estimate volume fraction of the, those two and depending on this. Okay? So that's a way of mosaic spread measurement or in-plane crystalline graphy, and you can do that. And then I think this is a grain size, the share of formula. I think if somebody asks a question, and then you can do the measurement of this by this peak width, set up reg condition of the red peak. And then there's a radian, you put it in, in terms of radian, not the angle of the degree. You put in radian and then at the Bragg angle, okay, not the radius, the Bragg angle, what the Bragg angle, cosine Bragg angle. And then here's the factor of B is the width of this, and then there's the size of grain size that is determined. So, other one is, I think, somebody asked a question is measurement thickness of field film is the many ways you can measure the film thickness. And then when you grow your thin film, and then one way you can do it is measure the surface profilometer and then use a very small sharp tips and scan it. And then when you grow your thin film, you cover certain regions of corner and not to deposit this. So you have a, this region is a bare substrate and this region is a film. And if you grow it, and after that you use a, a surface profilometer and then measure that. And then you can mechanically, you can scan it, you measure the thickness. But those technique is has some kind of poor resolution when your film gets thinner. So in order to get the reasonable measurement, you have to grow quite, quite thick film over like a 50 nanometer to 100 nanometer thick film to get the better, better accuracy. Okay? After you measure those things, then you can calibrate it what the, your rate, your time, or like a, one hour, you deposit one hour like a thousand angstrom, then you know how much you're getting. And that's the one way you can measure. Another way people do in situ is the QECM, a, a quartz crystal monitor. But quartz crystal monitor, after you do measurement, still you need to calibrate it by mechanically other method. <coughs> but if you do not have a good profilometers, and you measure very thin films, then you, you have different ways you can measure very nicely. And that is what we call coming from thickness fringes. And then these thickness fringes, and then very accurate measurement, and physical dimension you can measure. But one very important requirement is surface has to be flat. If the surface is rough, then you don't get this kind of thickness fringes. So the diffraction is coming from not only diffraction of the crystalline plane, you actually scattering is interference coming from the surface to the bottom of it because of your density of this and then different. So you get this kind of nice X-ray refractometer. And this one is a very low angle, zero degree all the way to low angle. When you just simply scan for your sample, okay, you get this kind of oscillation, a lot of oscillation. And this oscillation of those peaks is coming from this 
scattering or interference from this. And then when you go higher angle, you go high angle, you really see the Greg peak from this. But you have a two components, this one and that one, and then use this XRR, because X-ray reflect reflectivity measurement, and then you can decide. So basically you have a Bragg law, X-ray scattering like this, and then but also you can scattering from, from the whole field. So when you do this, you construct the interference when your layer thickness, and this feeding information measure a lot of information. It's roughness and density, and but this one doesn't need to be crystalline. So you can even use armor force material. It doesn't need to be, I mean, as long as the film is smooth, then you can measure this very accurately, your calibration. This is a good way to calibrate. And then you can use this one even, you can take a powder diffractometer, and then you can still do that. You can see the oscillation, then you can measure this. Okay, I'm going to skip that. What's so a way of doing it? Just simply measure spectral measurement and sample surface and align this way and use a copper K alpha line, monochrome and beam, as a parallel beam. Okay, that's all you need. And then beam has to be parallel beam, not the Bragg Brentano type of focus beam, it's parallel beam. And then you get this kind of phase difference, your phase difference here, and then you get same kind of 2D sine theta and lambda, you get the similar type of equation. But what you're getting here is basically this kind of oscillation is coming from the thickness fringes. And the main thing, what I'm going to show you here is this equation. Okay, thickness depending on theta m, theta m plus one theta m, which means you can actually pick one, these two, use this one is m, okay, this m, okay, angle for this m, Let's plug in here, and next one is m plus one, is m plus one, and you put in this equation, you get the thickness. It's a very simple way, just to scan it and do it, or you can have a download, free, free download, free software, you can fit the data. It's a fitting program. You have your own program uh, of the X-ray diffractometer, the data, and fit the data based on program, it automatically find what is the PLDC, what's the thickness of film. That's the one you can do. Okay. So for example, in this case, this film is roughly 10 nanometer. Okay. You can see the very nice 10 nanometer measurement. And then uh, you see the roughness is very rough like this, and you have a problem. You cannot measure this. You have to be very flat. Okay. So when you have a rough surface and you don't get this kind of oscillation, you get just a flat. So let me just do a perfect interface. Okay. You have a perfect interface and then you get very nice oscillation. And roughness is 1 nanometer RMS, 3 nanometer RMS. Your RMS, roughness is a very rough. You get this kind of pattern. Okay. So that means you cannot really measure the roughness. And this one, you can measure something, but not very good. So you can use this program, like a feeding program, to provide not only <coughs> determining the thickness of this, you can also determine the roughness. You can estimate the roughness of this. And furthermore, this modeling is include the roughness, density, interface mixing, and the many things we can do. And then it's a, you have this silicon substrate, you deposit some layers of 500 nanometer niobium thin films, you get oscillation. And magnetic thin films, you can do the oscillation. Any thin film you measure, you can see that as long as smooth, you can see the oscillation. You can get facial roughness and surface roughness, you can get the thickness of it, you can go those things. So what this is so what you do, you're trying to grow this magnesium, manganese with gallium nitride, and perovskite on and strontium titanate. And simulation is not only to total thickness and density, and also you can simulate its multiple layers. For example, when you do this, and then you have five nanometer and a 50 nanometer, you have this kind of different oscillation. Okay, 5 nanometer is thickness is very thin, the periodicity is quite long, 
And the 50 nanometer PDC is very, very small. You can see that oscillation. And you have these two layers. Okay, you have a double layers, for example. Okay, you have double layers. You have one layer, another layer. Then you get superimposed of this. You will see one oscillation comes from thin region, and then one oscillation coming from the bone. Okay, so we have a those two. So that means you have single layer feeding, and then you have an overlay feeding. You can fit the data using double layer feeding and single layer feeding. So you can actually get information of how much of interdiffusion layer or junk layer. You can, without going to TM or anything, and then first, uh, first check it and how good your film, how thick, and those things can determine. So for example, our film is, first time we didn't know what that is. Okay, now we know what it is. We grow this. First we found on top of surface, we could, we could, we could junk layer. We didn't know what the junk layer in the beginning. And then, uh, so x-ray fitting, always very strange. And later we found that, and this one coming from oxidation, and then uh, in the exposing air. And then this layer, like a few, like five or six nanometers, and then this manganese string garden nitride. And then you have measured similar things. You have this kind of super lattices. Okay, sometimes you grow not by layers. You have this kind of super lattices. You have nice super lattice, strontium titanate, and lanthanum strontium manganate. And then you can use this kind of thing. Your this oscillation, a small oscillation, is coming from it's a super lattice peak. It's an actual wavelength <coughs> of periodicity of this total thickness. And then you have additional peak, this one coming from Bragg conditions for actual these peaks. Okay? So that's what you can see superimposed so those two. And same thing here. And then your thickness fringes, uh, this equation I show you. But sometimes you make not only single layers, you make a super lattices. Okay? Super lattices is artificial. I mean, in the first lecture, I mentioned that is is a thin film techniques allow you to grow superlattice structure. So this kind of superlattice, and this is gallium arsenide superlattice, and strontium titanium lead titanium lead titanium superlattice, strontium titanium barium titanium superlattice. You can do all these things as long as you have two spider guns or two laser targets. You can actually switch back and forth, and you can make this kind of nice periodic array, periodic structure, artificial structure, and to study whatever dimensional crossover or interaction, interfacial, interfacial phenomena, you can do all these things. And then when you look at the cross-sectional TEM, it takes a lot of time and then effort, and you have this kind of nice layers. Okay, this is a uh, structure of barium titanium, strontium titanate. And then when you look at the space, and not only break flow, <coughs> But you have a fine you know, reciprocal space coming from super lattice peaks. Okay? This super lattice peak, so when you this electron diffraction and cross sectional TEM, when you look at the X-ray diffraction of this, you have this kind of diffraction pattern. The diffraction pattern is the main peak is coming from strontium titanate, lead titanate. For all this one, the small peaks here, they are coming from super lattice. So how you determine the actual, your super lattice, your thickness of each layer. For example, I use that three unit cell and then maybe 10 unit cell. I engineer the super lattice, how much accurately you made this, how you can measure it, really true your super lattice is a layer. Sometimes you grow the super lattices, ended up complete alloys, you know, you know, you know, diffusion, you mess up on the interfaces, you don't get super lattice. Then you grow the thin film, you believe your film is super lattice, and then measure the properties and report the data. Okay, this one coming from super lattice material we made. But how do you know your material is super lattice? And then two ways you can characterize simple way to do X ray fraction, and then like this. And then this is a lot more accurate, you can determine the periodicity. Because this break, break law, angle resolution is a lot better than doing this kind of measurement by TM. Okay, TM resolution is a measurement thickness is not very accurate. So what you could do, you can use 
this kind of simple x-ray diffraction work. Measure this position of the left peak, and then you pick, you pick one, two of any peak, maybe these two, or these two, or these two, strong two of those, and assign this one is n, this one is n plus 1. Okay. So before you index all this, we do not know what this number is. Okay. We do not know this break condition n value is we do not know. So we have to first find out, what, because sometimes it's initially we don't know which one is the first one, second one, because of 0, 0, 001, you missed the 0, 0, 001, because the background of the peak is too strong. So then you use the Bragg law, define new Bragg law, each of the peak comes from the Bragg condition of the, this super lattice. Okay, this whole layer, this whole layer super lattice provides the diffraction. And then let's define the thickness of this whole thing is a lambda. Okay, new lambda here, large lambda. So this one looks like a Bragg law, and lambda 2d sine theta, but it's not 2d sine theta, 2 lambda sine theta, because there's a new periodicity created by the super lattice. And then, but you have a two different peaks, not only single peak. So let's see, next one is n plus 1 and n plus 1, rather than n. Then you use this one and subtract these two, and then you get lambda value is, is basically lambda divided by 2 is sine theta n plus 1 minus sine theta. And doing this so, and then n value, we pick 15, and then the value of this sine theta is here, n plus 1, 6.9, and sine theta 18, you just pick those two angles, and plug this one, we get lambda 81 degree, 81.25. Okay, so that's the angle we calculated. So expect your super lattice period, based on C lattice parameter of the light titanate, the strontium titanate, your 10 unit cell and 20, 10 unit cell. And 10 by lattice parameter of strontium titanate, 10 by light titanate lattice parameter, that you add those two. You add up these two, you end up roughly 80.55 angstrom, and which is close to this value. So you can determine, you can determine the lattice parameters or, or periodicity using uh, this method. Okay, so that's uh, something you can do, simple X-ray diffraction, thickness measurement, super, super periodicity, and you can basically can do that. Okay, so any questions about this part? I just to go over review this and then additional part, uh, refractometry, uh, reflectivity measurement, and then superlattice measurement using X-ray refraction. You get it clearly? Okay. So I'm going to switch. My second part is using the uh, okay. I'm going to talk about here superconductivity. I think anybody know superconductivity here? Okay, superconductivity. Okay, this lecture is about the superconductivity. So, what is the hallmark? Hallmark of superconductivity is so, two important hallmarks. The first one is zero resistance. Okay. There's a no actual dissipation. There's a zero resistance. Yeah, flow the current and basically no resistance and no loss. Okay, that's a resistance. And second hallmark is perfect diamagnetism. Okay, what they mean is, is if you want to be a superconductor, you have to have perfect diamagnetism. You know what the diamagnetism? What the diamagnetism? Okay. So basically, external magnetic field and applied superconductor generating exactly the opposite of magnetic field 
creating persistent current on your superconducting material. <coughs> this is a hall two hallmarks. And this one can be measured by magnetic measurement you call Meissner effect. The Meissner effect actually expel all the flux and then you're creating we call current, okay? Current around the surface, uh, penetration depth is a current, and then thin layer of current on the surface and creating the opposite of the current. That's why superconductor can make a levitated train. Okay. Levitated train, when you apply large current and then you're by external magnet or electromagnet or whatever, and then you expel this one, you levitate. Have you seen levitation of the superconductor? You put the superconductor on top of the top of the uh, uh, the small uh, the uh, strong magnet on top of the superconducting pellet, and core like nitrogen, it just levitates because the levitation is coming from those. Okay, so those are two very important hallmarks of superconductor. Sometimes people confuse that okay zero resistance is only hallmark, but it's not. Okay, you have two components. So when you report any superconductivity, okay, you discover new materials, and you have to measure both. Okay, something like people recently discovered like 180 Kelvin <coughs> or close to room temperature superconductor in the hydrogen. Anybody read this one? Hydrogen? It compressed the hydrogen and then extremely high pressure and pressurize and close and get closer and closer to hydrogen atoms and then form the superconductivity, 180 Kelvin. And then in order to really demonstrate this, not only measure the transport measurement, the electrical conductivity, we have to measure magnetization measurement, which is superconductivity. So the, the superconductivity such a very interesting, and then this superconductivity originally comes from, and then a lot of metallic superconductors originally. Like a first discovery of superconductor is discovered in mercury. Okay, mercury is why they discovered this one. It's name called Ones, and then uh, he is from I think it's a, it's a Dutch guy. And then uh, he's the first one liquefied helium. And then uh, when you liquefy the helium at low temperature, and then and put it in your different materials, and found that mercury becomes superconductor. Okay, so that's a nice transition temperature superconductivity. And that's about, about, about 100 years ago. I think a few years ago was uh, like an anniversary of superconductivity 100 years. And then you can use a different types of element, not only of mercury, lead is also a superconductor, aluminum superconductor is many different elements, elemental superconductors forming superconductivity. But those superconductors are not very useful and except a certain type of application. A superconductivity <coughs> application is, is a two different tracks. Okay. One is, is people is most of people think superconductor need higher TC. The TC is higher, that's why 1986 superconductor discovered everybody got excited about this. Okay. Before then, superconducting high temperature superconductors around the 20 something Kelvin is very low temperature. And then first time they discovered 90 Kelvin superconductor, which is it can cool it with the nitrogen. The liquid nitrogen is very cheap and very easy to handle compared to liquid helium. Not only expensive liquid helium, but very hard to handle the liquid helium. Because the liquid helium is basically have you seen liquid helium? Anybody seen it? Really have seen liquid helium? <coughs> you can pour liquid nitrogen, you can pour liquid nitrogen, liquid looked at water. You can drip the liquid nitrogen, you pour this, you can see that, right? You see that? Have you seen the liquid helium? Okay. Liquid helium, once you come out, liquid helium, immediately vaporizes, you don't see that. You cannot, because of specific heat, specific heat of this 
of the liquid, heat, liquid nitrogen is quite high and can survive in air when you pour this. For liquid helium, you cannot do that. So that's why when you cool your dewer, and then first you cool with actual liquid nitrogen first. Room temperature down to liquid, heat, liquid nitrogen temperature, you pre-cool. And then, because <coughs> otherwise, Specific heat, you know what, what the specific heat curve looks like? Specific heat curve looks like this. Anybody seen that? Okay. Cp as a function of temperature usually like this. So high temperature speed is very high. So that means you need to a lot of cooling power, cool down around the room temperature. But you don't need the much cooling power at very low temperature because specific heat is very low. So in order to cool this large dewar and magnets high temperature region using liquid helium, you need tons of liquid helium, and then all evaporated, it really doesn't cool. So it's effectively pre-cooling by liquid nitrogen down to 70 Kelvin, 77 Kelvin, and then pump out all, all the liquid nitrogen, then you cool down by liquid helium. But not liquid helium, it's just a very slowly gas helium using gas and helium and cool, once the temperature reaches that close to liquid helium temperature, then you can condense and you can bring liquid helium gas. Liquid helium. So that's why some kind of trick. Anybody handle, anybody use liquid helium here? Use the liquid helium? And tra anybody done transfer? transfer? transfer. You, you haven't done the transfer? Okay, and you transfer this one, and then you have some, some tricks you have to use. So, Temperature is very important because uh, your temperature dealing with helium and dealing with nitrogen, yeah, liquid nitrogen, make a huge difference. Or even without not dealing with any coolant, and then room temperature even better. But there's no room temperature superconductor yet. But people are trying to find like a room temperature superconductor. Still, people as a whole to find a room temperature superconductor. Okay. So that's a one aspect of transient temperature. Okay, so transient temperature is a one aspect. The superconductor is when you use a superconductor for real application, TC is not the only one. Okay, people say, okay, only high TC. That's all I need. If you have a room temperature superconductor, now we discover room temperature superconductors may not be useful for real application because you have many important properties actually has to be satisfied those applications. For example, in the, in the low temperature super, like elemental superconductor like a mercury or lead, those things we call type 1 superconductor and which is when you bring magnetic field and magnetic field penetrate immediately once you pass the HC, okay? So it's a critical field, okay? You have a three different important parameters. There's a field, current, and temperature. There's a three-wave diagram, so critical temperature, and critical field, and critical temperature. There's three. So that's what we call kind of phase diagram. And then a critical field is penetrate right away with type one superconductors. And the type 2 superconductors, like a well, diamond 3 tin or some say compound, A15 compound, then those things, type 2 superconductors, which is, is flux lines, doesn't penetrate one time, it's a one by one. Okay? So we dry one by one, so HC1, and then once you completely lose it, you have HC2. Okay? Two different regions. Okay? I didn't have those background. I think people know here superconductivity understand what they so, in real application, you have to satisfy this high HC to high critical density, how much you can flow the current, because the superconductor is, cannot carry the current, infinite amount of current. You flow the current, initially its resistance is a zero, but past a certain like critical current, a critical amount of current, it goes normal state. Okay? It's no longer superconductor. So that is a point you call 
critical current density. And then critical current density is tells how much you can flow current. For example, you have uh, your transmission line, like electrical transmission line from one location to the other location. You pass the current here. And then how much current you can flow with uh, some narrow wires, very fine wires. And then you have a certain limitation. Normally, the critical current density of the materials is very high. Like roughly some of the materials at low temperature, certain materials like a superconductor ITC, roughly 10 million amps per square centimeter. A few times, few times 10 to, 10 to the 7, which means 10 million amps per square centimeter. So that means, think about it, your copper can melt easily that high current. Because one square centimeter, like this one square centimeter area, you can flow current 10 million amps. Okay, that's a, without losing your superconductivity and no resistance at all. And not 10 million, it's sometimes a few times 10 to the million, 10, 10 million uh, amps per square centimeter. So, so that is practical point of view. You need to have high critical current density or HC2 or we call another irreversible field. It's another term, I, don't, I didn't talk about it. And then high critical, tem critical temperature in all three. So that is a practical point of view you have very important. Scientific point of view, people is still trying to understand the mechanism of superconductivity. So the conventional superconductor, metallic superconductor, like a lead or mercury or all those kind of metallic superconductor. And then the superconductivity is well understood. That's why you call the BCF theory, the Badin, and then Cooper, and Schrieffer, and the three people proposed, and the theory for pairing mechanism. And then they call Cooper pairs. And then that can be explained the conventional metallic superconductors. But after discovery of this high TC superconductor, and then this one is a very different actually phenomena. And uh, is a pairing mechanism or the mechanism for this superconductivity in trying to understand this. But it's so complicated. And two different regions. One is in order to is actually propose and then and say something about mechanism, you have certain experimental data. You have some experimental data and then some evidence of certain mechanisms. So in order to explain the pairing of this, what the D wave or, or S wave, and that's why people make a grain barbary junctions of the triple junctions, and then you actually use this kind of trick to demonstrate it is a pairing, uh, the, the, uh, the symmetry of it. And sometimes you measure the tunneling measurement, and sometimes people measure specific measurement. Sometimes measure the transport measurement. You have uh, all different measurements, provide those data, and theorists propose some ideas of this mechanism, whether those things match with it. And then that's why I think experimental data is, is very, very important in two aspects. One is provide experimental data is accurate, intrinsic, so that this measurement data is truly happening in your sample, not the, some kind of extrinsic effect. Another one is you measure the, your properties or you engineer the properties, make this material much more useful for the practical application. So material is very pure and very nice, like a theory and then measurement, very nice, but not necessarily those things good for actual practical application. So, so famous, like famous quote, like um, it, it's, it's a TC. TC important. Somebody get Nobel Prize, like a high TC and then things like that. But in practical point of view, it's other, like a JC and H, and the reverse field is more important. So I'm going to talk about, and then now uh, one important the superconductor is uh, recently discovered. And then high TC 
discovered 1986, 1986 at the time, and then it's still people actually trying to propose, and the mechanism is not unified yet. And then since then, other superconductors discovered, okay, different ones discovered, but most recently is is an ion-based superconductor. Okay, the 1986 copper-based, copper oxygen-based superconductor, and this ion-based superconductor, that's why people really excited about this system. So I'm going to talk about a couple of um, important um, the aspect of thin film can actually contribute to understanding and in both aspect. And especially is the flux spinning is making this one very strong and application point of view. You need to have some kind of mechanism to flux spinning and then that's what I'm going to talk about. So, so we have a two types of work we have done. One is single layer of epitaxial thin films of we call nictite ion based superconductor. Barium 1 to 2. I'll talk about what the barium 1 to 2 is. Then I'll talk about artificially engineered superlase. Maybe I talk, just mentioned that how to determine superlase by X ray fraction. So that's something I'm going to discuss. So, so this one is why called barium 1 to 2. And then this whole serious compound is like a barium ion and arsenic is a 1, 2, and 2. The ratio is a 1 and 2 ratio. And then this barium 1, 2, 2 is when you dope, this is a metallic system. And then when you dope it with a cobalt, like a few percent of cobalt, like 8 percent cobalt, it becomes superconductor. Okay? Similar to like a when you dope it, okay, lanthanum copper oxide. Okay. Lanthanum copper oxide first they discovered this one superconductive lanthanum barium copper oxide. Lanthanum copper oxide is antiferromagnetic insulator. Okay. Antiferromagnetic insulator is not superconductor. But when you dope it, the barium, then it becomes superconductor, like 39 Kelvin superconductor. That's the first discovery of the, uh, the oxide superconductor cuprate superconductor. So this one, ion nictite superconductor, is a lot of, it's initially discovered by Japanese group, okay, and then you have a many different family of ion superconductors. This is a 1, 2, 2 type of superconductor. We get 1, 1, 1, 1, four different elemental compound superconductor. Well, we have 1, 1 compound, like ion selenide superconductor, which is other class one. So we have a different class of like, superconductivity, but I'm going to talk about this particular value one to two. So as I said, studying epitaxial thin films is important for those two, fundamental physics, and then fundamental physics is understanding intrinsic properties like HC2 and then measuring like a coherence length and then measurement of a lot of important fundamental properties and then your pairing mechanism or pairing symmetry and also interesting to measure something important properties for application critical current density and then you have some other interfacial properties you measure this so the growth of value 1 to 2 it's very, very challenging in the beginning. When you got this one, it's discovery of this one 2010, okay? Actually, before 2010. And then the growth of this initially is not very obvious. Okay? Growing this one, pendulum is not very obvious. Okay? I can tell you why it's so not obvious. Number one, you have arsenic. It's very, very volatile. Arsenic is sublimation temperature is very low. And then, and the other ones, the crystal structure looks complicated. And then, all this material, a certain substrate, when you characterize these influence, 
Okay, ideally, you want to deposit in insulating substrate because the insulating substrate doesn't short it out, so you can measure some properties. So, what is the some kind of bottleneck here? Is is volatile, and sublimation temperature only 614 degrees C. <coughs> And epitaxial growth is a lattice has to match, and deposition rate is reasonable, substrate temperature is high, and then when you look at this barium 1 to 2, barium, iron, arsenide, there's no common element between the oxide substrate and barium 1 to 2. Barium 1 to 2 is basically is metallic, an intermetallic system, but oxide substrate contains oxygen. So, do any substrate share common features with value 1 to 2 and then and substrate? Okay. So, we have to find out whether that can be done or not. So, when you're looking at this uh, crystal structure very carefully, this is initially we have come up. Look at the crystal structure value 1 to 2. Your building block, the barium, and then iron arsenide, barium, iron arsenide, barium. So you have a, this kind of shift of this creating, looks like a triangular structure. Okay? And then this lattice here, compared to perovskite lattice, is very similar to this. And then lattice parameter of this, in plane lattice parameter, is also similar to perovskite structures. Okay, so that means, well, I think there's a commonly, you have something common feature, so might be able to grow this on top, only difference, we have oxygen here. <coughs> okay, so you look at this, well, we have the strontium is on the top, and then, or you have a titanium oxide top, you have a TiO2, is the first layer, then next layer, not this one, you can replace these atoms on top. Okay? That's a reasonable, very reasonable assumption. So, you have a two possible is a scenario. One is, if you have a strontium termination, or your TiO2 termination here, okay, you have a termination of this termination, or that termination, like a oxide cross. Remember that? Okay, termination. So we have a possibility of two different possible termination. In here, strontium termination and this titanium termination. And above this strontium termination, first layer can be iron arsenide. You have a titanium termination, more likely barium, oxide, barium layer. Because based on stacking sequence, looks like this is a more reasonable thing. Can you, can you think about it? Is it understandable? So you have... This, this layer is very similar to this. So that means this one is ideally, ideally uh, on top of the TiO2. But you have uh, this layer on top, and this one and that one very similar. On top of it, this layer is more likely. Okay? So that means these are two possible hypotheses, interfacial structure, that it can be grown. So when you look at the TiO determination in the cross section of TM, and you look later look at it. And then use our hypothesis correct with titanium here. And this strontium titanate substrate, okay, this strontium titanate and titanium termination here, and you get immediately you get barium layer. Okay, you can see the barium layer, and then go iron arsenide layer. You can see that. Okay, so it's a, exactly you can grow nicely. And this can interface. Why this is so important is so which layer on top, which layer facing to what layer. Because recently, some of the uh, interfacial superconductivity in monolayer iron arsenide, iron selenide, and then a mechanism for this interfacial superconductivity, one monolayer, and it must be very sensitive or related to this underlying substrate, especially strontium titanate, actually structure of the strontium titanate. And one group proposed is iron selenide is one monolayer underneath. It's not the single layer TiO2. It's proposing double layer TiO2. 
and then n rho t i mean ion selenide. But our observation of bearing one to two is not. Okay. It's, it's clearly directly bearing oxide grow on TiO2 layer. Okay? And the strontium oxide layer is a little more complicated, but strontium oxide layer, a lot of distortion on the surface. So it's not very ideal structure, but I'm not going to focus on this strontium oxide. But this is a lot more complicated, so I, I want to skip that. So we have successful growth of value 1 to 2 on strontium titanate, and based on this structure, okay, it looks like you use a strontium titanate, and then your value 1 to 2 will grow. So what you did is grow this one on top of STO, and then your critical density at roughly 4 Kelvin, more than mega amps, like 1 million amps. It's quite high. But the TC is uh, roughly 20 Kelvin and shock transient temperature. The problem is your substrate is conducting. Okay? Your strontium titanate become conducting when you heat it up in vacuum and creating a lot of oxygen vacancies. So it's commonly when you use a strontium titanate as a substrate and then not in oxygen environment and then it becomes conducting. So when you measure transport measurement, and then you short it out. Okay? So you have here very low resistance, normal state resistance, is coming from your substrate. So it has still become conducting due to formation of oxygen vacancies. And then this one dominate normal state behavior. Okay? Then how do you overcome this problem? And to overcome this problem is you have to use STO as a bulk substrate, very thick. STO as a template, very thin template, and then a non-conducting substrate. But that steel strontium titanate is conducting when you actually create this one in vacuum environment. But your thickness is so thin, your actual resistance is very high compared to your value 1 to 2 superconducting material so that the current flows, all this current flow, only superconductor, not the template layer. This is relative resistance, right? So you have two layers parallel circuit. And one is conducting, one is more or less conducting. Then current distribution is more likely to go up, not going down. But in bulk, Strontium titanate is this thick, and even though conductivity is not very good, but your conductance is big because it's a whole thickness contributed. So that's a problem of strontium titanate. So when you're doing it, okay, let's use strontium titanate on other substrate and then do it. So the way you do is Okay, barium titanate or strontium titanate, very similar type of material on top of like a lanthanum strontium aluminum tantalate, which is substrate material, it's insulating, but same paraffin structure and a very similar lattice parameter. This one is lattice mismatch, maybe less than maybe 2% or something. And you grow it, you see that surface looks like this, and then this fully coherent to else substrate and this one is fully coherent and then you can grow this one and you can see the nice read pattern and then you can grow this material you can see quite nice uh, structures but one thing I'd like to tell you here very interesting background so we grow this two different substrate one without any template layer, directly value 1 to 2. One layer with a strontium titanium template layer, and then value 1 to 2 on top. Just a very thin layer of uh, strontium titanium. Okay? But you see the X-ray refraction, now you understand X-ray refraction quite well, because I cover a lot of this thing. And obviously, one you see here, and strongest peak in X-ray diffraction in this kind of thin film 
is substrate pH. Okay, so substrate pH is a very strong, like a, about more than 10 million counts per second, and you have the lead LCS substrate, 002 pH, and strontium titanate is, is a lead cell substrate, a very strong pH here, these two positions, you can see that. When you lay down the strontium titanate, very thin, the strontium titanate pH you see here. Okay, can you see that? Okay, so that's also something you check it here. And then all the rest of pH, except you have O1, O2, you have two substrate pH, O1, O2, you have substrate pH, and O1, O2, strontium titanium pH, rest of them are phylum pH. Okay? And then you see some other pH is O1, O2, O4, O6, O8, you see the pH, O2, O6, O8, you can see the pH. What you see is clearly, what you clearly see here, your intensity of this pH, compare this intensity of pH, is O4 pH, is substrate pH, let's compare substrate pH here. This substrate pH here, roughly 10, 10 million. You see that? 10 million. And this one is roughly 10 to 20 million. Can you see that? So then your substrate pH is comparable, which means your diffraction condition is very similar. Okay, 10 to 20 million or 10 million. But look at this intensity of this one. It's right like 1 million or higher. And then this intensity of 004 is only what? 10,000 or 30,000. Okay? This is one indication of this. Well, this is not good, this is better. But where do all the intensity goes? Well, all the intensity, why is the intensity so low? And then you see, it's clear, I mean, this one is this kind of small peaks, is, this one is K-beta lines, but intensity is very, very low. So, first thing you can check is rocking curve. Remember the rocking curve we have already done? So, rocking curve is, okay, let's scan the rocking curve. When you scan the rocking curve with strontium titanate, this temporary layer, you see, and this quite narrow, you see that? Can you see that? Like either barium titanate or strontium titanate, this rocking curve is a 0.1 or 0.4. Okay, 0 0.37, 0 0.14. This is narrow, you see that? So that means your mosaic spread, the so mosaic spread this one. Oops. Mosaic spread is very small. But when you look at Bayo 1, your rocking curve over 3 degrees. So that means your intensity is low because you detect this one only break condition or certain fraction of it. So all other ones get away from it because so you count you count this intensity compared to you count this intensity. Okay, but if you go away from this, it's a bright condition, you go away from here, like roughly one degree, and you won't see any peak in the strontium titanate case, but you still see strong intensity in this case. You, you understand this? The rocking curve is? So clearly, all the low intensity is due to bad crystalline quality, okay? So that is only when you see this kind of Bragg okay, mosaic spread. But more importantly, when you look at in-plane, you mentioned that in-plane one I mentioned? Okay. But before I gave this lecture, in-plane one. In-plane one, you have this barium titanate or strontium titanate one. You see it only four peaks. Can you see that? Or four, and then this width is quite narrow, like a 0.58 or 0.8 is narrow, and this one every four, which means your all of this from the top view, from the top view, looks like this. But look at this one, in the directly grown L set, you see that one, two, three, four. In between, you have another peak. 
it was really bad. And intensity of this, so low. You see that here, it's the same kind of order of magnitude, the background, the background here. So one, two, and here, roughly three order of magnitude higher than this. And then, not only intensity is low, and then width of the broad, the mosaic spread broad, your killing factor here is some kind of 45 degree domain, which means looks like this. Your structure on the top view, your grain looks like this. Exactly what I show you before. Remember that? Okay. Exactly like this. So you see, from this X-ray refraction pattern, okay, I know that your grain has a mixture of this one and that one. So, then what happened is, if you have these two kind of domain, you're creating grain boundaries. And then the grain boundary is one of the really killing factor for high TC superconductor cuprate one. Because in conventional superconductors like a nibium 3 tin or, or like a conventional one, your superconducting coherence length is very long. Okay, which means you have whatever defects, whatever disorder, range of length scale smaller than coherence length doesn't matter. It's okay. So that means coherence length like 200 angstrom, for example. And that means you have a grain boundary width, maybe 10 angstrom grain boundary width, and then it doesn't feel like anything. It just goes through. But this high TC superconductors, and this one too, coherence length, especially in cuprate superconductor, is in the C direction, one angstrom or two angstrom, which is really small and compared to grain boundary width, a lot wider. So that means any high angle grain boundaries, it's cut supercurrent. Superconductivity cannot go to next grain. And here is on conventional superconductor value one to two, the superconductor coherence not as short as cuprate in C direction, but it's much shorter than conventional supermetallic superconductor. And then this is the Problem. So we know, obviously, this one is better than this. So, look at the crystal structure here. Well, this is electron diffraction pattern, and this electron diffraction pattern, and cross-sectional TN. And this directly grown L set is some grown template L set. And then this one, you see a lot of columnar growth. But your X-ray diffraction and electron diffraction pattern, very nice square pattern, rectangular pattern, which means consistent with the X-ray data is epitaxial density. But in here, a lot of high angle grain boundaries, you see that these kind of grains, all the grains not periodically arranged here, it's kind of random, it's kind of messy. So that means this one tells you have a lot of mythology grains. Then you expect this one not going to be good. So you measure the resistivity of these two. Let's measure, look at this resistivity. And then these two measure the template, strontium titanate or barium titanate template. Your resistivity is quite low compared to <coughs> direct current L set. So this normal state resistivity, high resistivity coming from a lot of junk and then grain boundaries. So when you do your superconductivity measurement, people focus <coughs> on your measurement only superconducting properties. But you also very important measure normal state properties. The normal state properties tells a lot of information too. This normal state properties is this is a much higher resistivity and then you measure the slope. The intercept, the slope, is, is kind of grain boundary or like a defect scattering. And then you see quite different behavior. And then look at the TC. And TC of this one a lot sharper and higher than this one. You see the very broad transition. And TC are roughly 15 Kelvin compared to over 20 Kelvin. Okay. So now it's just simple. Same, same perovskite structure, and the lattice parameter is similar.
But just changing very thin layer of template make a huge difference between those two. And then you measure the magnetization, and the measure the magnetization of this is a field code, a zero field code measurement. And you see magnetization is quite strong, and TC is is around the 20 Kelvin in both T cases, template case. But without this, the signal so weak. So that means you have superconducting material creating this kind of a shielding is very well, very weakly coupled. And you can see that how small compared to like a even 5 Kelvin, and this only minus 10 EMU per cubic centimeter compared to 6 times 10 to the 3 and cubic centimeter. So you clearly shows and then strong diamagnetic signal much better shielding. So why this thing happen? Why is this so much different? And also we look at the, uh, the, the magnetic optic image which is uh, the flux expelled and then you measure the critical current density very dramatic. The critical current density of this direct run L set so low is roughly few times 10 to the 3 amps per square centimeter. Because so low. But when you have this kind of epitaxial thin films, and then this value is few times 10 to the 6 amps per square centimeter. Okay? But what you see here, this one going to high field, a very high field, and then you still maintain this kind of critical current field. But even higher than bulk single crystal. The bulk single crystal is supposed to be cleaner and better without much defects, but thin film is much higher than bulk material. And this value very similar to measured by magnetic optic image, like 3 amps per square, 3 mega amps per square centimeter, and this one, like a 3 mega amps per square centimeter at 4 point Kelvin, is very, very similar. Okay, so different measurement technique provide very similar pre-current density. But the interesting thing is, why this one is better than this? Okay. So when you look at the cross-sectional microwave, before you do that, you measure the angular dependence. Okay. Angular dependence of critical density, which means you apply magnetic field at different angle. And then you measure the critical density is anisotropy of critical density. So this is the critical density as a function of angle. You see, apply magnetic field perpendicular to the film, for example, you have a film like this, a okay, surface film, you apply the magnetic field that direction, okay, the perpendicular direction, and then you change this angle from normal to gradually like this. Okay? Gradually like this, and this one is parallel to the surface, perpendicular to the surface, you angle change, and when you change the angle, you get maximum critical density when you apply this way. When you go a low angle, it drops like this. Okay, why is that? So, this one indicate you have a certain flux pinning. It's yes, that's right. More flux pinning perpendicular direction because you have this region very, very strong and go down like this. And then usually, it's a flux, the pinning of flux because of the reason critical condensate is very low, you have flux line penetrate into the sample. And then this flux line trying to move around, that's a dissipation. So in order to have dissipation is less, you have to flux lines, like a magnetic flux line, you have to hold it. You have to hold it like this. Okay? It's a move around, it has the dissipation, and then which one is strongest flux pinning, and then that helps your critical density high. So in here, when you look at the cross-sectional micrograph and planar microview, planar view, you see a lot of small 
dots. Can you see the, all the dots? Very, very tiny dot here. But the cross-section of microgram shows these lines, okay, all the lines. Okay, these lines is from the top view, you like this shape, and the side view is a line like this. And then that is very effective pinning a flux line, because of this rest of area is superconductor, and those things is non-superconductor region. Anything flux goes in non-superconductor region, and they stay there, I'm happy there. I do not want to be outside. And that's the way you can have a, is a very strong flux spinning vertically aligned, some kind of second phase, and this C axis pinning center. And what is it? And then actually, this one, let me see, this cross, okay, we don't have cross. When you look at cross section of micro gap of this one, and that region is oxide. What kind of oxide? is barium iron oxide. Because when you deposit this, when you make a target, initially we didn't know this, because when you make a target, target never be perfectly pure. Because you have oxygen incorporation in the target preparation or background pressure, and then those things provide this flux pinning centers, but it potentially nucleate from the interface. So that means it's very interesting. Freedom to choose substrate using template engineering here. Your barium bare L set, bare LAO, bare gadolinium scandate, all bad. It's all 45 degree misoriented grain. Okay, everything L set, LAO, gadolinium scandate, all bad. And then TC very low very broad transition and critical density is very low. Okay? But when you put any strontium titanate, barium titanate template on top, you have no 45 domains, TC or red one very high, and transition width very narrow, and critical density very high. Okay? Something is magic, just putting very thin layer, okay, only 10 unit cell or very thin layer, change this one dramatically. So what you see here, clearly common feature of this substrate, LAO and then gadolinium scandate and LSET is a lanthanum aluminate. And the common feature is this first rares, okay, is plus three. And then this one, also plus three. And then this one, plus two and plus four. So somehow your ionic charge can play the role in growing. And because of barium one to two, barium going on top is plus two. Right? So the common chemical or polar, non-polar, we do not know whether polar and non-polar plays a role, but actually the common feature of this first cation and when you show first thing is all right initially tio2 substrate and you have tio2 plus four i'm happy to have barium layer on top not lanthanum layer so that's our lanthanum layer may have some rotation so that's so something is is titanium oxide termination and then this model exactly match with what it proposed So I'm going to talk about this escape pit. And how much time is now? 11. Okay. So let's take a break. I'll come back here. Super lattices. Then I'll talk about the piezoelectricity today. Then tomorrow I'm going to do some lectures of two-dimensional electron gas interfaces. But I'm going to have some time afternoon. Maybe tomorrow we can arrange some lunch here. I'm going to have a more practical session how to set up your vacuum system for deposition system, which is useful for you guys. And then how, I think the more, more practical things I'm going to discuss with you, and then is it helpful? Is it helpful for you guys? Anybody? Anybody plan to set up your own system here?
phone chamber, building something. I think it's not, or modifying your existing system to make your need. So you have a UG system, you put it in something different, spiders, and then, then you can modify it and make your demand. I think that helps. So I'll talk about uh, like a flow control systems and then like a I mean, vacuum measurement and all the, it's more like a fundamentals, more practical things, and maybe tomorrow afternoon. Is that, that's the most useful? Okay, all right, let's take a break and then come back again. Conductor. Um, second part of it is uh, superlattices. I think the, the, in the morning I talked about some characterization of superlattices by X-ray diffraction, and then um, here um, expand this artificial layering to actually overcome single layer, and the material cannot really achieve some properties in superconductor. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So some origin is the motivation here, as I show here. And then when you look at these images here, and then this flux pinning along the vertical direction is very effective, but all other orientations are not very effective. Okay. So you want to have, can you have this kind of, of the flux pinning, can you make a flux pinning critical density more uniform, all different angles. So that means when you uh, use uh, these uh, centrolums or or any the uh, nictite superconductors, and then can you use this one more or less isotropic and flux spinning all different directions? So obviously, this is a very effective vertical, <coughs> not very effective that way, and not very effective that way. So you have to do something. So the motivation here, can you do this by, okay, this is something, motivation is artificial flux pinning in this uh, ion-based superconductor. And you see that the vertical, a lot of flux pinning, and then this one is a, is a epitaxially arranged barium ion oxide. And then this is, um, is, is a, the uh, only strong pinning H parallel to see. And then uh, for real application, and the high critical density at the wide range angle, and then we need C axis, and also you need the flux pinning in the AB direction. So you want to enhance this more eventually, and then you can more smoother. So this is the, some kind of a design of this structure. So this is a structure we have, single layer with the nano pillars. Okay, nano pillars. And then uh, we didn't expect in the beginning of this growth. Later we found that, and this nano pillars forms very effectively all of the place. And then uh, when you make a super lattices, <coughs> just simple super lattice, and you get this kind of layering, maybe it is a very effective flux pinning only AB direction, okay, in the plane. But can you make your structure is this? Can you do that? And can you do this both vertical or horizontal? Then you can make a network of flux pinning that you might be able to do, enhance the flux, uh, the uh, critical density, all different angles. How do you do that? So, so AB flux pinning by insertion layer of certain second layer, and then the second layer can be very effective. We can test it. So what you did here is, okay, use a strontium titanate insulator because we can grow this value one to two on strontium titanate very nicely. So you can insert strontium titanate every certain distance, like a roughly here, periodicity from here to here, like 14 nanometers. And then you stack this on many layers and then what happened? And chemically, strontium and barium are both alkaline oils and divalent. So that's why we expect this one doesn't have any you know, fusion or any problem. But structurally, and those strontium titanate and this one 
very similar that is from here. So expectation here, we have already demonstrated this of <coughs> adding one to two on top of strontium titanate, but we never try strontium titanate on top of adding one to two. Okay? So oxide can be grown on top of adding one to two. That's a very important test. So we did that, we grow this one, and the single layer, okay, super lattice, uh, super lattice, super lattice we grow super lattice, and this super lattice, you see that very strong peak of substrate, LSAT, and template of strontium tire template here. <coughs> then you see O2, O4, O6, O8, very strong peak here. When you look at this region very close to here, you see that the satellite peaks. Okay? The satellite peaks comes from the superlattices. Remember that? I showed a lot of peaks. Anybody remember? The first lecture. And this one is coming from addition of periodicity coming from superlattice. Okay? So your measurement of this, you calculate the periodicity, you can calculate it, and you know what the thickness. And then we actually design 14 nanometers and then you calculate this, and then what is the value, calculate value, the 14 nanometer plus by 2 nanometer. That's our estimate. And then your phi scan, azimuthal scan in the plane, and then this STO, and then all these two layers, value 1 to 2, shows a very nice in plane of taxi. So that means your value 1 to 2 grow on STO very nicely, as good as actually directly on STO and then and things like that. So you have this one demonstrate your crystal equality value one to two nice. But this is the actual structure of TM. And then this one else has substrate, very thick substrate L set. And you have STO layer, it's a template layer. Okay? Then you value one to two STO, value one to two STO, value one to STO. You just make up many, many layers, and the periodicity of this one, 14 nanometers. And then you blow up this region, you see the STO, and bearing 1 to 2, and this one is done just first laser position of two targets. You switch back and forth. Okay, this one, bearing 1 to 2, then after that, you switch this STO, and this back and forth like this. Okay? And then you see the interfacial layer, you can easily can define what layers here, and then it's quite nice. Okay, so then in this region, we do not see vertical columnar structure here. Okay, so previously single layer is in a lot of vertical columnar structure. You have no columnar structure. Okay, the reason is no columnar structure. Any oxygen coming from value one to two oxygen coming in your background, those oxygen consumed to grow STO. Okay? So that's why STO is better oxygen gather than value 1 to 2. So that means there's no place to go oxygen to form the narrow pillars and then very clean value 1 to 2 plus STO layer. So when you measure this and critical current density measurement and critical density is similar to this and the H perpendicular, H parallel to C, it drops much faster. Okay? It drops much faster because no strong flux filling H parallel to H perpendicular to the surface plane because of no flux pinning. But instead, you have a strong flux pinning parallel to AB plane. Okay? Can you see that? So, it clearly your layering makes a flux pinning your layering flux spinning is very strong, H parallel to this direction, but very weak that direction. Remember that single layer film, you show the peak here, very strong peak, but the no peak here. Remember? Remember that peak? But here, it goes the opposite because of your layering go that way. So now, okay, so how can you make this one? Here strong, here strong, both strong. So now we know that 
this strontium titanate, this oxygen together, and remove all the nanopillars. But I still need nanopillars. Okay? Nanopillars, that means you don't want to strontium titanate. You want to have something different. Rather than strontium titanate, non-superconducting layer, but does not take oxygen away. Okay, what it is? What is it? Then you can use parent compound, which is non-superconducting, but chemically very similar. So that idea here, okay, let's use battery 1 to 2, pure, undoped, which is non-superconducting, which is still can be a flux spinning center, and then cobalt doped battery 1 to 2. So you just mix those things, and hopefully, this one is a good flux spinning centers in that direction, then still you're creating a lot of nano pillars, you can vertically, you can make a strong flux spin. So when you grow these films, and then you see very nice of taxi, and the rocking curve is still very narrow, and you see that in plane, it's perfectly nice, and narrow this, but you cannot see satellite peaks here. Okay, why? Why you cannot see satellite peaks here? In order to see the satellite peaks here, you need a strong contrast. You need a strong contrast of the, those two layers. Because the one layer, one layer is a value 1 to 2. Another layer is still value 1 to 2, but replaced by the very small amount of cobalt layer which means those two layers, atomic scattering factor, okay? atomic scattering factor cobalt and iron is not much different. It's very close to each other. And also percentage-wise, only a few percent of this. So that means those two layers in X-ray feels very similar. And then that's why you don't get any strong contrast of this and no superlative speed. And then, so look at this. This is the actual cross-sectional TM image, and you see a lot of contrast here it coming from is one layer has a little more oxygen in it, and still you see that these layers is oxygen, and also forming the vertical nano pillars here. Okay, both nano pillars and these regions <coughs> we have both of them. When you make this one, and then somehow the pure banding one to two has a little more oxygen preparation of the target and that is why you may have little more divergence of, of these uh, nano, mm. nano structures there. So you have the STO and then this you can see a lot of layering but it's not strontium titan like a very clear area. And then when you look at this cross-sectional uh, the resistivity and transient temperature is very sharp but look at this this is H parallel to C, okay? H parallel to C. And this one is a superlase with a strontium titanate and battery one to two superlase and drops so quickly. But one you made is a is the doped, undoped one, and then this one maintained the quite well up to very high field. Okay? Very high field up to and STO inserted superlase is very poor. But on those value 1 to 2 in 31 is very, very good. More surprisingly, when you look at this angular dependence, okay? so angular dependence of original value 1 to 2 single layer with all the nano, nano, nano pillars, you see that flux pinning is very strong along the page parallel to C. And then when you do single layer, a superlattice with a strontium titan layering, very strong flux spinning H parallel to AB plane. And how does it look? This <coughs> uh, barium 1 to 2 undoped, barium 1 to 2 cobalt doped one superlattice, how does it look? Looks like this. Okay? Because you have enhancement of C direction, but enhancement of AB, then you see is uniformly very strong flux spinning and JC, and this value is a lot higher than any of those. Good. So this one is 
very simple basic concept of nanostructure using the nanostructure existing self-assembled nanostructure formation. We understand that. In addition to self-assembled nanostructure, and plus, you can add artificial layering and enhance angular dependence or differentiation. The reason I talk about this one is, is one of the example of how your superconducting properties can be engineered or designed and realized in ideal flux spinning and then properties you need. And then that clearly shows and beyond this, we did a lot of other measurements, like the pinning forces and other measurements. But I think for this lecture, I think this is the idea I'm trying to convey is, is, is actual generation of design, design of structure, not only rely on set for assembled nanostructures, but your artificial <coughs> structure can make your ideal, your superconducting properties, and then in this system. Okay, so that's what, and the, this, the second part of this. So you can actually see, is designing this may be useful for certain things, like uh, you make tunnel junctions because you're starting tightening tunneling barriers. But the, for the flux spinning, you can use this kind of layer structure plus columnar structure, and then you can obtain and very high and then uniform or anti-isotropic flux building in very much. Okay. So that's a, something I want to I mean, emphasize. And then using your uh, the artificial layer structure formation and then not only superconductivity can be improved, you can design your magnetic properties or any thermoelectric properties because uh, one of my colleagues is using thermoelectric properties measurement, like uh, designing thermoelectrics, and then your electrons and phonons, and then it's, it's, uh, you can separate those contributions. And the Galliard center superlasis is one of the way you can make this thermoelectric or properties much better than single layer films can achieve. So, the so same similar type of similar type of principles, similar type of idea. You can expand. You can expand your like uh, platforms of a playground. You have only single layer can do this much, but you actually adding superlattices and then and then your artificial creating artificial structure, and you can have a lot more <coughs> playground. You can make and then you can achieve some properties cannot overcome by single layer or single component of material. Okay, so that's all on an example. So I'm going to stop it here for superconductivity here, and then I have to, sh because I have a lot other superconductivity slide here I want to show, but today I may maybe stop it here, and maybe tomorrow I can bring some more, but uh, I want to stop and I want to show some uh, piezoelectric um, system and then uh, so I'm going to uh, stop here. So I'll take some more questions now. Did you find some strain, like some strain structure and benefit in GSA? In here, uh, the film we grow, because the lattice parameter, is, the structure is, a, is a quite, lattice parameter is big and the structure is very uh, different. And then in this case, the, our thick film is all strain relaxed. So the strain doesn't play here. But uh, when you have a new data, which is, uh, hasn't published yet, and then your strain, if we are to use a strain, not epitaxial strain, a thermal strain. Okay, thermal strain is much more effective in battery one to two, in substrate. And you use a, like a fluoride substrate. You use a calcium fluoride substrate, or lithium fluoride substrate, or a different substrate. And thermal strain is quite different. You can actually, enhance the TC quite a lot. Even you can make an undoped superconductor bearing one to two, making superconducting two. So it's a the strain is very effective, but not in here. This one is no strain involved. It's all relaxed.
Any questions? Okay, so then let's move on to uh, the other topic and then uh, we can finish up those things in maybe an hour and then take in some questions. Okay. Anybody know what is a piezoelectricity? Anybody know? What's a piezoelectricity? Okay, that's one way. Anybody know other ones? Okay, the piezoelectricity is very widely used in many things. Anybody seen like a small kiss jumping around and see something light blinking at the back of the shoes? Anybody seen it? Not in here, in here? Anybody seen it? You see it, right? Jumping here and then you can light blinking. That's a like a piezoelectricity and then make some sort of signal to the blinking like this. <coughs> and the, the, the piezoelectricity is, is a phenomena when you apply stress, when you apply the stress in material or your stress form, when you think like this, okay, your stress generate the charge. This is the piezoelectricity. And conversely, you apply the voltage field, you change the dimension. So that's a converse piezoelectric. So that you have two ways. One way is stress generate charge, or field change the dimensions or shape. So that's a piezoelectricity field. And this piezoelectricity used many, many applications. And for example, piezoelectricity is like a shoe, simply. But piezoelectricity is used for medical imaging, biomedical imaging, medical imaging. So I'm going to show you a few things. So, the piezo electricity, and then that's the phenomenon I mentioned. So, your piezoelectric is one of the component of one of the interesting properties is all the complex oxide can achieve. And then I'm going to spend time a little bit about this. And I talk about this, I talk about this, and then you have other material systems. But the, this piezoelectricity, has a lot of application, medical imaging, and sensing, actuation, electronics, and energy harvesting. We can do all different things can be done by piezoelectricity. Okay? But piezoelectric is well-known phenomena, but the one of the exciting part here, using these piezoelectric phenomena, it's a large piezo response, like a huge response on thin film form. So you can integrate and then you can use this one for some new application and new, new directions of this. Because this one is electrical energy can be converted to mechanical energy and that's the most effective piezo -electric. So piezoelectricity is linear coupling between polarization and and apply strain or strain. So for example, you have intrinsic phenomena. Okay? Intrinsic phenomena is single domain and single domain structure, like single unit cell, without electric field and atomic position stay here. But when you apply electric field, this atomic position is shifted away from the center, then expand your unit cell uh, this way. Okay, this is a intrinsic piezoelectricity from the sample. But you also have extrinsic component, extrinsic component coming from domain walls. Okay? What means your domain walls, you know the ferroelectric domain walls, anybody know the ferroelectric domain? Shape looks like this kind of pattern. When you apply magnetic field, 
the domain E through other domain and make all single domain. Remember this kind of thing? Similar thing is you apply electric field that direction and this domain pointing that direction move to this domain. So when you do, initial shape looks like this, but finally shape changes like this. Okay? It's simply domain wall motion is another contribution of field electricity. Sometimes this contribution is really big compared to intrinsic component, and that's why we need to understand all these different components, different contribution of the field electricity. And other ones is coming from field induced phase transition. When you apply electric field, the tetrahedral state actually initially is this one rhomboidal state. Rhomboidal state goes to tetrahedral state, you have another phase transition, then you have a phase transition involved, you get the phase big change of shape. So you have a both intrinsic component, extrinsic component due to domain work, or involve the phase transition. A very complex thing. And then this is the one, actually ultrasound medical imaging, the piezoelectricity, a piezoelectric material, better piezoelectric material, and better material integration makes this image 1960s, 1994, and 2003, you have quite different quality of image. How you achieve this image to that image, this is a 3D rendering technique. If you, now I think if you go to the hospital, you look at your fetus and the, your, your baby and your, 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 your uterus, which, um, and then you get this kind of image. Okay? And this technique is, is available because you have this kind of two-dimensional array of piezoelectric sensors. Old days, this kind of image was a single piston, single element, and single element can scan it very slow, and at the same time, you cannot make the fast scan of large amount of data. So, using is this kind of development of this stage is multiple things. One, better piezoelectric material, integration of piezoelectric material to the dimensional array, and then your computer software, your rendering technique is a very large data rendering coming here, then you can imaging processing, like image processing is done. So this is the one, for example, two dimensional array 256, 256, like a 65,000 element, okay? 50,000 element, your phase array, the phase array is scan this one and you detect it. So basically, as I said, your piezoelectric material has a two different functions. One, you apply, apply stress, create the charge, or you apply electric field create dimensional change. So that means, nice thing about the piezoelectric material, you can use the same element to generate, generate this one, or you can detect it. You can do both. Okay? Understand that? You can same element can do it both ways. So what that means is, you apply electric field, okay? Your AC, you can apply AC, okay? very high frequency AC, then you, this one moves like this, okay? You move, this one moves that way, what happened? This dimension moves, then this one push, push air, okay? What is that? Acoustic wave. It generates acoustic wave, and then wavelength, acoustic wave, the megahertz, of the acoustic wave, like a few megahertz to like a hundred megahertz acoustic wave. Then acoustic wave is is not harmful. Penetrate your body. You go to the body, then you bounce back with a different different bouncing back because the different water and the bone and that is a different bounce. You bounce back and sense it, 
and then when you bounce, bounce back, this opposite way back to, and this one convert to charge, electrical signal. The electrical signal back to your computer, and then your all the phase, all the different element detected different regions. Okay, that's the basic concept of imaging, and then you have this kind of multi array is much more efficient than than single piston. Another one here, when you go a heart problem, and then you do you know the catheter? Catheter is is a bring your fine tube attached to this kind of ultrasound imaging transducer, which is piezoelectric transducer, and then you bring in your artery here, okay, you bring here, cut it here, bring in the heart, and then you image it, at the same time you treat it. Okay? Sometimes you're uh, like an irregular heartbeat, and it causes a problem, so you have to actually make those regions stop it. And then you have this catheter and then ultrasound, you have a lot of different wavelengths, uh, the, the uh, frequencies, megahertz to like 100 megahertz. And, but the idea here is better resolution and deeper penetration is always desirable. And then the you know, giant piezoelectric material is ideal. And also, you want to make this kind of array. And this kind of array has been done like manually. But anything you can do, like a microfabrication, and then you can do microfabrication, allow you to do is much more reproducible and low cost, and that's a more ideal one. So, one important issue is a material issue. Okay, you have a good materials. Another one is people making like a maskless lithography, and the MEMS here, the people use. It's a lithography using these uh, very tiny meters, okay, these tiny meters, and these meters actually control the optical, and then this control by <coughs> electrostatic, like a silicon electrostatic, like a actuator, and then moving these individual meters, and the major challenge here, this kind of actuator, and then need to go smaller and smaller, because higher resolution lithography, but the problem of most of the electrostatic, the actuator, needs a lot of high voltage and high, vo the high voltage because of operation of this. And also that is not linear. It will go like, a, go like this, collapse it like this. But the, you want a more linear and low voltage operation is always desirable. So force achieved the electrostatic actuator, roughly 100 volts, only 0.01 volt in the like a NEMS device, like piezoelectric based one, you need a lot less voltage and then to operate the same thing. So the material we have been interested in is we call relaxoferroelectric. Okay? Relaxoferroelectric material looks very complicated and lead, magnesium, niobium, lead titanate, we call PMNPT or lead, magnesium, zinc, lead, titanate, PZ, and PT. And those things, as piezo response, is like a 10 times bigger than most of the piezoelectric ceramics, PZT ceramics. So it's a very high piezo response. And the value of this, roughly 1,500 to 2,500, very high response. And then that has to be single crystal. It's a bulk ceramic material, so poor, you cannot use it, so all this uh, device paid for single crystal material. And then this is single crystal, like a yellowish color of single crystal, people grow by Chokraski or different method. And then this piezo response is as a function of electric field and strain, and the slope is basically piezo response. So we need a small field, how fast how steep, and that tells, you can see, the PZNPT, <coughs> the single crystal, compared to other type of ceramics here, and the ceramics very low slope, and this slope is a lot steeper, okay? So, 10 times bigger, and then the other one is strain, you can go roughly 1.7%, it's a very large strain, 
And then electromechanical coupling, your coupling means energy, electrical energy to mechanical energy coupling is a lot higher. And then this is a one interesting reason why this uh, material has a large field response. And you have a phase transition. Initially, it's rhomboidal structure like this. And rhomboidal structure go certain point rhomboidal expanded that way like the way it does is when you apply rhomboidal polar axis like this when you apply electric field rhomboidal go like this get okay, closer smaller okay that means expand the that direction and suddenly some point it goes to tetragonal like this okay from here go like this and finally it goes tetragonal like this okay so that means you have a tetragonal induce the tetragonal region, this region, and then it changes the slope, but you get continuously large strain. So the way we did it is we need to integrate this one on silicon so that you can use a smaller MEMS device rather than boxing crystal. Because people made the boxing crystal, they use a lot of bulk like application, but we are interested in like a smaller scale of device to use this field length material. So PMMPT is perovskite structure. Okay? And then you can integrate in a silicon. You have to use template layer, strontium titanium template. Okay? Yesterday I talked about this. And then use a strontium ruthenate as a bottom electrode. We have to apply electric field. So the bottom electrode has the strontium titanate. So what you did is grows strontium ruthenate on top of strontium titanium or silicon, then grow PMMPT on top. But PMMPT growing this one is somehow the PMMPT has a lead is more easily can evaporate in the surface. So we get on, we grow this material without any particular things, and you get a lot of polycrystal-like or pyrochrome phase. The pyrochrome phase on these are phase. And then what we found that, and that the, the, the terrace length of the silicon here is quite long, very long. So whenever lead or lead is uh, deposited on the surface, and then it actually evaporate quite quickly. And instead, when you have miscut on silicon, large miscut silicon, you're creating a lot of steps. Remember, very similar to BFO. And your step distance is very, very short. So that means you lay down, you go step edge, and stabilize it, and then lead does not evaporate. So that's something very simple like concept. You have a long terrace length, which means a no miscut. If the terrace is long, and then more likely atom attached to it and then evaporate it. But in here, easily go and form it. So, when you do that, just simply change the miscut. You have really bad thin film to beautiful epitaxial thin film. So, miscut makeup yesterday I talked about. Okay, miscut makes what? One day we talked about miscut. Is making domain engineering. Okay? So, making domain engineering from so four <coughs> domain to two domain to one domain. But this miscut also provide additional composi composition control and make a phase field material in this approach here miscut, like a 4 degree miscut and not this one in strontium titanate or silicon it makes very pure and very quite dramatically different structures and if you look at the cross-sectional TM of this you see strontium ruthenate and strontium titanate very thin buffer layer on top of the silicon. Here, silicon, STO, strontium ruthenate, and PMMPT. You see the electron diffraction pattern? It's all epitaxially arranged. And then your cross sectional TM, PMMPT, and strontium ruthenate is quite nice too. And then your actual crystalline quality of rocking curve, the full and half maximum of this one even better than boxing crystal. And then better than strontium ruthenate actually grow thicker, your the mosaic spread improves. Okay, this is a 
some common things you will see when you grow film sometimes grow thicker certain system you cure the crystalline quantity what they mean is initially this one is not of this mosaic spread okay when you grow thicker this mosaic spread cured like this more flatter okay so this is what happened but the in plane one cannot be cured because in plane one you have to go to free surface you have to go all the way to free surface but this one is not easy to cure so that's what happens here you get crystalline quantity is better than underlying it. so we measure crystalline response and PM and PT on silicon is a lot better than previous work or PDT on silicon and you dramatically improve the quality of PLD response but more importantly here you measure this and then PLD response compared to all the PSO material and the aluminum nitride or other type of P random PDT but this is called energy harvesting figure of merit when you use the PSO material for harvesting energy because uh, I have seen I think you guys have seen like uh, when you like uh, people just uh, battery pack I have a battery pack my, my uh, uh, my cell phone and then can you continuously charge my battery as long as I'm, I'm moving so you can have here piezoelectric like a high energy harvester and you vibrate it and then vibration create a charge go back to the battery then you can continue to charge and this is not something people is thinking is okay some 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 locations you cannot replace a battery. For example, you have all the machineries, like you have a machines operating all the machines, very complex, very, you cannot reach by hand, but you cannot reach that point by people. Or electricity is not available, it's a, like a, a border, like a country's border, you want to have a, like a, um, like a um, surveillance camera, for example. You don't want to go and electricity there and then put it in those things in the trees or something like that and then you want to have a, like a like a wind blows and motions can create it or you have a the machine vibrate all the time and that continues to charge without actually going to change the batteries or electricity so that's something is used as a energy harvesting and then and that's something useful information about the large figure of merit in this system but more importantly you make a, this kind of cantilever you can make a, this cantilever using PMNPT cantilever when you electric field electric fields actually have, to have a, this kind of reflect deflection you move this one cantilever move this much okay? the team motion the team motion is quite large team motion and then from 0 volt to 2.5 volts, you can watch T motion. You look at this comparison of this T motion by PMMPT cantilever and compare it to electrostatic, a silicon like a cantilever, like a cantilever made by silicon. Remember that, as I in the beginning, I have a vascular lithography using silicon spring. And then you can see the same amount of displacement, for example, I want to achieve like a 0.6 micro displacement, and this one requires less than one less than two volts. Okay? This one less than two volts, but this one more than 30, 40 volts. Or even smaller one here, even smaller, in here you get less than 0.3 volts, but in here you still need 20 or 30 volts. So that is the advantage of going to piezoelectric and low power and then low operation, low voltage operation. And then another nice thing about the thin films, you make these thin films, this is a very similar to what you say exchange bias, and this we call built in bias. The built in bias means you want to have your polarization preferred a certain direction. So that means your bottom electrode strontium luthanate is preferred to polarization down way, so it doesn't switch that way. 
So it's most of piezoelectric response, piezoelectric application, you don't want to switch. You don't want unipolar operation. You want to operate unipolar the same direction. You just <laughs> apply electric field going that direction. So that's, uh, that's why you have strong built-in bias and uh, much more preferable than and bulk material and then or interdirector. So another thing here is clamping is a very important factor. Substrate clamping is a very important factor. So you have like a strain and thermal strain, all these things plays a role. But I'm gonna skip this one. I think that may be too too much of time here. Okay, let, let me show you a few slides here, maybe helpful. Okay. So when you have a, this PMMPT or any piezoelectric, ferroelectric phase diagram, and this composition, a PMN, PT, you see that pure PMN and PT, so the 30% of PMN, PT, that's the largest piezo response. Okay? So you can see that in the rhomboidal regions and tetragonal regions, you have this kind of boundary, we call this the MPV boundary morphotrophic phase boundary. And this phase boundary in rhomboidal region, your piezo response red, more gradually drops, and tetragonal region it drops very rapidly. <coughs> but most of piezoelectric material people use composition in, in this region. Because once you hit here, go too low. And then this region, safer. So this one is a few 2,300. This is some of their calculation. But this is real data, this is a PZNPT, not PMNPT. And the real data looks like this too. Okay? This MPV boundary here, MPV like a 10% or 9%, rhomboidal region goes up and drops tetragonal very quickly. Okay? That is, is a bulk material. But this kind of phase diagram, depending on strain, okay? and depends on clamping. So this is all box single crystal without any other effect. So, so far, all this study done only box single crystal, but when you go different types of like a thin films, you get like a clamping, make this phase diagram much higher content of the lead, and then you strain, tensile strain and compressed strain, your phase film changes. So the message here, is when you use a bulk data, you cannot use a bulk data for thin films because your total phase diagram changes due to clamping and strain. For example, this MPV boundary for bulk single crystal is 30%, but just simply clamping, it moved to 60%. And the strain can change not only 60%, you have a new phases created, like orthorhombic rhomboidral, rhomboidral tetron, you totally very small 0.2% strain, dramatically different phase diagram. So that means when you do this, you have to really understand and the phase, phase formation, and then sometimes, okay, 33% is 30% good for bulk, let's make a 30%. But no, I think you have to use, depending on this, you have to design the composition different from the original. So I think with this is all others we actually design and different substrate and composition and we play this, but I think uh, I'm not gonna go the details of that part. And use a different substrate, the Scandi substrate, large variation of substrate lattice parameter, and you can make your, your test of this kind of phase diagram. So this is another RSM diagram. Are you familiar with this one? Reciprocal spray mapping? Yeah, this is one of the examples this for mapping. It's a coherent. Is everything coherent? Can you see that? Okay, coherent. And this one? Off center? Incoherent? And you can see which one? PMMPT. And then this one? Substrate here, not here. Because silicon substrate is far from here. The lattice parameter is quite different. But you're gathering this candidate substrate much sharper. Can you see that? The okay, crystalline quality substrate is sharp. You have here, but other layers is much broader. 
Okay? So I think you have this kind of butterfly shape because of tetragonal and then uh, all other things. And then uh, this all, uh, I will skip that one because that's uh, too much. So one of the people is trying to use is a piezoelectric material for electronics. Because you have a large strain actually with a low voltage, low power, can have very fast switch, low power switch, and then that's what the idea. Because your most of the uh, microprocessor here, and then it stops this kind of clock speed increased gradually and around the 2000 and stops. Okay, it flattened. The reason is is is, a, is a, you have a limitation of voltage lowering the voltage because silicon electronic cannot lower any further. So the idea is you're trying to use the piezoelectric <coughs> strain to induce piezo like a, this piezo resistive piezo resistive material like samarium selenide. So Merium selenide has a very strong metal insulin transition by pressure. And then pressure is seven order magnitude change by pressure. Okay. For example, I think when you have this kind of color, like a metallic color, when you scratch it, when you scratch it, color change to black. And then we remove it, we go back to gold color, because the pressure can make an insulator metal transition. It just simply you can actually see that. And then that one, on top of piezoelectric layer, apply electric field, and the piezo response can change this one switch. Okay? That is some very important, and IBM is interested in, in this kind of concept. The other thing is, you have piezoelectric energy harvester. And then there's the energy harvester, and then the energy harvester and using this kind of, this is done by like a uh, like Sangu Kim's group at MIT, and they have used this kind of nonlinear uh, resonance mode, and then using this kind of non-resonance mode attaching here, very effective energy harvester. This energy harvester is you see that is using like small size of coin shape thing, and depending on what kind of a trio and how much your energy you can generate. And then this type of things, you can pick up wide range of the uh, excitation frequency. Because uh, sometimes resonant frequency, you can use only a very sharp frequency, which means not very effective. But you want to take all the frequency wide range using this nonlinear motion resonance. Then you can get a larger response. So this idea is using this our the uh, piezo response of your PMMPT, <coughs> like the 1,200 picometer volts, <coughs> then your generation of roughly 200 watts per square centimeter compared to, and then other ones like two watts per square cubic centimeter. It's, it's a it's dramatically different size, increasing the harvest piezo response. More importantly, here is one other idea. First day, I talk about magnetoelectric coupling. Remember the magnetic coupling? The idea I present in magnetic coupling is based on exchange bias. Everybody know exchange bias? Okay. Antiferromagnetic layer to ferromagnetic layer exchange bias. Okay, that's the interferon. But that is very sensitive interface. Okay? The interface is very important. But another way you can do the magnetoelectric device, piezoelectric coupling. Okay? So when you do this is a theory calculation by Long King Chance Group, and then using piezoelectric material, PMMPT, when you apply strain on piezoelectric material, and then metal, like a nickel, like a large piezo restrictive, okay? Piezo, piezo, you know, the, the, the mega restrictive, you know, mega restriction, <coughs> mega restriction is a, your, your strain can change the NSR piece, the mega restriction. And the restriction of, of silicon nickel is large. And if you apply electric field, you change the dimension by piezo. Then you change the magnetic anisotropy of nickel. And then using this anon, 
and you can make a tunnel junctions, you can make a name ramp. And their calculation shows very fast, high density, low power, as low as sort of 16 femtojoule per bit, and high speed operation below 10 nanoseconds. That's a theoretical calculation. So, as long as you can do, this is a boxing of crystal, but you want to use thin films. You could box in crystal like a millimeter thick, you need to apply a few hundred volts. You don't want to apply a few hundred volts, you have to apply very thin, small voltage. And that's why when you use a piezoelectric thin films, apply a few volts or less, and then you can operate this and magnetic coupling based on piezoelectric device. So here, the piezoelectric material integrated on silicon that bulk material, and bulk material is already done many, many years, and integration of this large piezo response, single crystal form, not polycrystalline or textured one, epitaxial thin film form silicon, then allow you to do all kind of silicon mens process. Silicon you know, mens process, silicon mens process is a microfabrication process, and you can do Make a device is a piezo device, and then allow you to unparallel the piezo response in this thin system. But you have a high strain piezoelectric thin film heterostructure silicon can be used in integrated MEMS device, actuation, sensing, imaging, and then all possible applications, medical, electronic, energy, and then or magnetic devices. I think that's a, I mean, very exciting field. And then uh, it's a, your thin film is a simply you can use is a, a different type of design of the uh, structures, MEMS device structure using this and allow you to explore all these possibilities. So I'm going to stop it here and then I'll take some questions and then uh, and we can finish up today's lecture. Any questions? Does this piece of electricity have any temperature dependence? Like the voltage produced uh, is lower at higher temperature? Absolutely, like that? yeah. Temperature dependence. So you go low temperature and high temperature, phase transitions, and then you have a, a, a dependence. Thing. So we have to look at the phase dynamics of temperature phase dynamics. When you go high temperature and then you lose the piezo electricity and then, then you lose the uh, piezo response. So when we are using this uh, piezoelectric material, sometimes there is some heating of the material, like if you use an NRAM and all, if there is some heating... Oh, within, within those, temp those temperature range, it's perfect fine. I'm talking about a few hundred degrees C or like a 4 Kelvin or something. Within that I mean, room temperature range, is fine. Especially PMMPT has uh, some kind of peak because of the relaxed ferroelectric. So when you, if this one is tuned, the properties of this the X of electric tune, and then at room temperature, to the largest response. But it's, it's a, usually this one is a broader transition, like a X of electric, not only piezoelectric, and then also frequency dependence. When you have a frequency dependence, you have dispersion, and then and then this one is designed for maximize room temperature. And there are any other materials other than PM and PT most commonly used piezoelectric materials? <coughs> Okay, piezo piezoelectric material, people use a PZT ceramics for many years. But before this one is, uh, is realized, and people use a PZT ceramics for designing different types of piezoelectric P PZT ceramics. And advantage of PZT ceramics, okay, you can make it easy with powders and sinter it and design it. But it's, it's a property so is not as good as PMMPT. So now with PMMPT is dramatically increased the piezo response. And then two materials, so Clearly, yeah, PMPT and PZMPT, those two are is the best material. But I think people are trying to design and new materials beyond those two. If the film is fully relaxed, suppose if you use 500 nanometer film, then also this uh, MPB boundary cannot be controlled. I mean, it is dependent on the strain the opposition changes. So yes. how are you controlled? Absolutely right. So in silicon here, in order to really understand this MPB change. In silicon problem is thermal strain. Okay. Silicon has, uh, for example, silicon lead thermal expansion coefficient is smaller than its oxide. So 
when you grow this influence beyond like a 1.5 microns or something, do you know what happened? Cracks. Because it's like your film is trying to, trying to stay large. Okay? And then when you grow high temperature, okay, try the thin film is trying to shrink. The okay, thermal expansion coefficient of the oxide is larger than silicon. This one trying to shrink. But the silicon does not want to shrink. Basically, it's stretching it and you cool down, it cracks. And then if it doesn't crack, that induces the thermal strain by, by temperature difference and thermal strain quality difference. So you have to consider that there's tensile strain in this one and also clamping effect. That's why when you do this, is you have to really computation. We measure the strain and what the phase diagram. Then you design the composition. What is the ideal composition to maximize the strain and peel response? That is the, has to be done. So so far, people didn't realize this. They, everybody used okay, bulk is right, and the thin fluid should be the same. But I think it's a very sensitive to strain and clamping effect. What do you mean by other parameters you're talking about? For example. Uh, what will be the criteria to know what is the best device? I mean, the criteria to determine I think one of the here is uh, driving this is a piezo electrical energy to mechanical energy. Conversion. Anything you want to do this kind of conversion. I mean, especially like a, like a medical imaging. And what other choices? without non-destructive, non-harmful your body. And anything you have, like a, for example, your CAT scan, or something like a new, sometimes an MRI, people use a different scans. And then those scans, is okay, but it's your baby, it's a, it's a fetus. You don't want to have a lot of exposure of x-rays. And then it's an ultrasound, it's maybe the most safe way to actually image those baby is, is a healthy or not, and then how they grow, and then those things are important. But uh, sometimes you have uh, MRIs necessary, especially soft tissue, and then sometimes a uh, CAT scan is needed. But CAT scan is a lot of x-ray exposure. You have a like, section of this, and then it's, it's nice imaging, but I think uh, that is another problem. And then it, it's electronic, um, like a magnoelectric coupling or other things. And people are thinking about what is the best way to get low power, I mean, low power device, or creating new functionality. And that's the one. What is the better way to energy harvesting? And I think of some environment, you don't have any other energy source. Solar energy harvesting is one way. For some area, no solar energy is dark, completely dark. Then what you can do about it? I think the one is using this kind of available energy to conversion, you have no choice, then, then I think this is the best way to do it. Claxel ferroelectric and the flexo electric devices, they are same or so? No, it's different. Flexo electric means you have a strain gradient. A strain gradient creating polarization. That's a flexo electric. So maybe something you create, you grow through thin films and the strain relaxation very quickly. And then bottom is a very highly strained, and top is not, and your strain gradient you're create, creating for that. But there's a different phenomena. But that's also a very interesting phenomena. People can make a, like a pyramid shape, the nanostructure, you press it, then your strain gradient is large, then that's the way you can do it. The other one people are thinking interesting is flexomagnetic. A flexomagnetic is an interesting phenomenon, and then, uh, but those terms, equation, is, is different. Piezoelectric and then flexoelectric term is different. I mean, that, that's something you can, uh, you can read some other <coughs> papers, and then uh, flexoelectric studied a lot, too. Yes? So when we grow ferromagnetic layer on PMNPT, what exactly happens on either phase? All the PMMPT we use here thin films or, or single crystals. 
deposit of nickel at room temperature, not high temperature. So when you grow at room temperature, and you do not expect interdiffusion, not like high temperature. And then uh, one of the problems of depositing metal on oxide is bonding is very weak. If you do not have certain type of like a atomic scale of reaction. For example, when you deposit gold, you deposit gold on any oxide sulfate. You scratch it, you can easily move it. Okay, very weak. Bonding is very weak. There's no chemical bonding. In order to make the gold a very strong bonding on oxide, do you know how we do? Anybody know how to make a gold on the surface of silicon oxide? Yes, chromium or titanium, the intermediate layer. You put the intermediate layer between and then make oxide to metal, TiO2, titanium oxide, and then forms, and the metal, titanium to gold, the metallic bonding, make it strong. And the nickel is not as reactive as titanium. It can nucleate the I mean, free energy of the formation of the oxide, but it's better than, more reactive than gold. So why expect when your nickel lay down on the surface of the PMMPT, you have a certain type of chemical bonding. And that's why when you grow nickel, not room temperature, when you go a little higher temperature, nickel actually grow on perovskite substrate. Nickel FCC, that is primarily roughly 3.54 or something. Perovskite substrate, strontium type 3.9. That is mismatch is like large, but it grows quite nicely at a few hundred degrees Celsius. For room temperature, and then it doesn't grow that way, but I think the bonding is quite strong, and then not extensive inner diffusion. Maybe one atomic layer has a chemical bonding, but in this case, we are not using, we are not using exchange bias. This bias is, is, is a strain. The strain actually propagates quite long distance. Okay? So that's why these advantages, when you have a strain, and the whole nickel can have this negative anisotropy change due to magnetic friction. How the uh, strain interact with magnetic domains in thermal mechanics? Yeah. Well, that is so we all know is a very friction coefficient. Okay? For negative mega restriction or positive negative friction, so nickel has a mega friction coefficient in which direction? And then when you apply here, the strain goes to here, shrink, and this is going to expand. Then piezo uh, the uh, magnetic restriction of nickel follows direction of this. The negative one, then you shrink, then you can magnetic easy axis go in that direction. So you can actually predict this one quite easily. And other people use different type of material, nickel or some other like a uh, intermetallic compound, and then uh, I think uh, some other materials. Some people use strain-induced phase transition, magnetic transition, anti-ferromagnetic, then use those things too. So I think the strain induced many different things. The reason I brought this one, strain is uh, another important now, not the way of strain engineering I talk about first day or second day. Those strain engineering is static strain engineering, which means you grow material different substrate. You have different substrate, but in here, you can do dynamic strain engineering. You can apply strain, you can change the properties dynamically. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Initially, you make a film on barium titanate or gadolinium scandate, and then your transient temperature goes up very high. But in here, you grow the material on this piezoelectric platform, then you apply electric field, and you can generate strain, then you can modulate your properties, not existing ground state. Okay? Or you can, by applying strain, you can have unusual properties can happen by strain. And then one example here is, it's a mega restriction, and then your rotation of magnetic anisotropy, and then build on top, like a magnetic tunnel junction, then you can make a MRAM type of device. <coughs> or you can use other types of multifunctional device, like a, a magnetic decoupling device. Yeah.
more questions? We have a few more minutes, so feel free to ask. Okay, so I covered. Yeah, go ahead. Is so uh, say again conventional and specific features. okay specific features of those two in terms of growth or in terms of properties in terms of properties characterization most of conventional one I haven't studied that much except we grow naive treatin in our lab the naive treatin we grow naive okay, those two are conventional superconductor metallic superconductors. And then one thing we do, those kind of materials, it's a less sensitive to uh, some kind of defects or, or grain boundaries. So for example, we grow nibium creatine, if, even though this is a polycrystalline, and superintrenchant temperature is really nice, it's really good. But nibium creatine, or especially pure niobium, polycrystalline is fine, but it's very bad for oxygen. So you bring oxygen in, the TC suppressed. And nibium 3 is a composition, nibium 3 nibium 19 composition is a very important. So you have to have a <coughs> quite sharp, you have a line compound you have to achieve. And then in other types of these uh, unconventional superconductors, and the most of conventional superconductors, very sensitive to defects and grain boundaries and disorder. So that's why unconventional one people didn't thought, didn't, haven't thought about this, but high TC discovered, and the people trying to grow polycrystalline other substrate, and not, it's not superconducting at all. Old days, they want to make a more defects, to make a material more interesting, and then very dirty, and then messy. That's what they used to do. But in the non-conventional one, you have to do make a clean, and well controlled. <coughs> And then actually understanding the, all the defects or boundaries and twin boundaries, I think it's, the approach is quite different direction. And now we understand those. So I think once you know how to make a clean and then and then and then perfect material, then you can make it dirty very easily. You understand? So initially very dirty, then how to clean clean pieces to measure. So the approach doing in, in the unconventional superconductor, okay, let's make it first perfect. Let's make it clean. And let's make it is well defined. Then once you know this, you can actually make a design to make whatever defect, whatever grain boundaries, and then you can make those things. So for example, I want to study grain boundary defect. How you do that? Just make a perfect single crystal. How do do that? They make a bicrystal substrate. Bicrystal substrate at one grain boundary. You grow that, you have one grain boundary, you can measure it across the grain boundary. And that's the different approach. So it's a quite different approach, but I think, uh, I think it's, you understand this, this, uh, the way of this approaching science in those two. Then I think especially most of the multifunctional complex oxide <coughs> You want to approach them more clean, more intrinsic, and then design it, make it build something artificial, or grain boundaries, or what you can ion irradiation, or you can do all this, you can play that. Is that a clear answer? I, did I answer you? Okay, all right. Any more things? <coughs> all right, so we'll do tomorrow, and then. Um, how to tomorrow? Uh, to the electron gas. To the electron gas. I think it's time to shut off. So, so tomorrow we will do uh, the battery itself. So I can just stop. Can you still hear me? So we'll tomorrow we will do interface and actual interface, which is a quite important field. And then I will do some more practical. Do you guys have the time tomorrow afternoon? Tomorrow afternoon we can do that, or after lunch? Or you want to compress it in the morning?
and then I'll finish it around the one thirty. Which one do you prefer? After lunch. After lunch? After lunch? You wanna eat? Okay. So let's eat lunch tomorrow. Then we have a more informal setting. I can talk about practical how you can actually grow the balloons and optimize it. What is the operating parameters? And then building your system, how you can actually design your chambers and things like that. I think that may be something I want to do for that. And uh, is it useful? Any other things you want to hear? Okay, so that's tomorrow, like a little early finish and we lunch, and then afternoon you spend time a little bit, and then, then done. Okay? All right.